Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 10 as we stand, as we honor and reverence the Lord this morning. Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, it's my prayer that in the next few brief moments we have, that you'd speak to hearts and speak to lives. Father, we've gathered this day because we are needy people, and that's needy because we need you. And Father, all around this auditorium, there are hearts that are empty. There are hearts, Lord, that has desperately in need of what you offer. Father, I pray that you'll preach this message through me. Lord, that the words that we we will speak will not be mine, but yours. Father, I ask for your divine help this morning. God, equip me to preach this message. And Lord, please, let me see, say those things that we need to say. And Father, please, don't let me say anything that will go against your holy name. Father, thank you for this large crowd. Thank you for this sweet spirit. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. One thing today that is very frustrating, and it's this. If you have a cell phone, and you have to constantly put that thing on the charger... You're somewhere out and you cannot use your phone because it went dead. Out comes a charger once again. Now, I, I know that probably never happens to you, but uh, have you ever just wanted to get your cell phone and throw it just as far as you possibly can? You know quite well that until you plug your phone up, it's not going to work. You can't make calls. You can't do anything. Your phone is dead and has no service. But I want you to understand this. Once you plug your phone into the power source, something happens. It becomes back to life. It becomes useful once again. Your phone, here's, I know we're just talking this morning, but watch. Something that's unique about this phone, watch, is it even tells you the percentage you have left, and you watch that. Now I'm 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 serious, and it 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 it, it cra- well. Let me show you something. It shows you the percentage that you have left. And something last night that happened to me. I had my cell phone on on the charger, wasn't paying attention to it, and, and watch, the thing started speaking to me. <laughs> I thought. I have never had a cell phone speak to me. And I thought, what is going on? I thought, well, you know, maybe the preacher's just lost it. Maybe he's gone over it on the edge. Then sitting there not paying attention, about 15 minutes later, it said it again. (laughs) And it said something like this. Your battery is overcharging or it's hot or it's all of this stuff that was going through. I never heard that before. And I thought... How in the world does it know these things? And I looked down and the bars were up where it was supposed to be. And I thought, well, it don't need to be charged. And it said the battery was overheating. I didn't, I've never heard this. Some of you understand what I'm talking about. So well, I, I thought, well, surely if it's overheating, that's not a good thing. So I put a glass of water on it. I thought maybe, <laughs> heck, I did I thought, well, you know, that's, you know, surely that'll bring the temperature down. 
If I'd have had chicken soup, maybe I'd have give it to that. I didn't know. But in my case, sometimes it's necessary to charge my phone several times a day. What is true with our modern day cell phones has a spiritual application as well. Sometimes you lose your spiritual power and until you find the power source, you will never function at your best. Now get this, many today know that they are out of power, you have no bars, and you're dead spiritually. And believe it or not, you have been running on a dead spiritual battery for a long time. But let me show you some things that something that might be causing a strain on your relationship and your ability to discern God's design for your life. In the Old Testament book of Jonah, we have a classic case of someone whose spiritual battery was dead. Now mark this down. When you are not running at peak performance spiritually, you can make decisions that have drastic effects on you and it can have drastic effects on others. Our man Jonah decided that he would just do the opposite what God wanted him to do. God said, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I'll decide to go to Tarshish. A poor decision by a man of God running on a very low spiritual battery life. Now think about it in today's terms. God would call Jonah on his smartphone, instruct him to go to a particular place, and like many, somebody would do this. On our phones today, and you know this, you have cell phones, when somebody calls, in a lot of instances, now this is what happens when a preacher calls you, so watch. In a lot of instances their picture will come up and you know who's calling you. So when you see the preacher's picture, here's what you do. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that today. <laughs> Don't you feel like sometimes that that's exactly what Jonah did to God? Jonah, God was calling Jonah over and over, and he saw that and says, I don't think I want to pick that up because uh, that's not anything that I want to hear. Now let me just tell you what a powerless Christian life looks like. Any desire to spend time with the Lord is taken up by other interests. Church attendance is sporadic because you leave no room in your schedules. There's no margin in your life. Giving is out of the question because you're trying to fund your lifestyle. Spiritually discipline, uh, spiritual disciplines really doesn't matter that much to you because you've been on a boat sailing away from the Lord for a very long time. You haven't found a power source in a long time and it's not like the Lord hasn't been trying to get your attention. Now notice this chart that we'll put up on the, upon the screen right quick. The Lord tried to get Jonah's attention, at least in this short book, about six times. Look, in verse number one, verse number three, it says, but the Lord. Verse one, verse 17, now the Lord. Uh, chapter two, verse one, the word of the Lord came. Chapter 4, verse 4, then said the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 9, and God said to Jonah. And chapter 4 and verse number 10, then said the Lord. Can I tell you something with that? What is true of Jonah is exactly true of you. Can I tell you over and over and over in your spiritual life, God has been trying to get your attention so that he can tell you some wonderful, marvelous things. But here's how we think about when God calls us and when God instructs us. Here's what we have a mindset about that. Well, God wants to call me and God's trying to get my attention, but I don't want to go to Africa and speak to those people. I don't want to go overseas. I don't want to do that. I don't want to place my life into that. But can I tell you this? God may have something really divinely inspired for you to do. And the fact of the matter is, you and I have ability just to hang up on God. Isn't that remarkable? When God speaks, we hang up on Him. But the fabulous, watch, the fabulous thing about God is this. Even though you hang up, He still stays on the line. Wow. Woo! I'm glad about that because let me just tell you this. In my own personal life, when I got married, I had no... Well, let's just be honest. When I got married, I had no desire whatsoever to be in the ministry. And God says, I'm calling, 
and I says, not now. God says, I'm calling, but I decided to hang up on God. And can I tell you, this thing went on for several years in a row. And I just decided that it, now watch, I just decided it was more important for me to get out into the world and make more money. I just thought that that would be the, be the, the everything that Judy and I would need. Let's go out, let's make money, and let's just do our thing. Yeah, we went to church, you betcha we did. And the offering plate passed, we put our little, whatever it was in there, whatever was handy, we threw it in there. But can I tell you, there was no satisfaction in my life. The pressure and the desire to follow God kept coming back and coming back and coming back. But here's what I understood. Listen, I watched what pastors had to go through. I seen it with my own eyes. I saw the hurt. I saw everything that happened in pastor's life. And I decided a long time ago... That life wasn't for me. After all, I'm an introvert. After all, I don't want to be in front of people because they look too scary. I don't want to be up there. And I don't want to look at their faces because every Sunday they look like they're going to eat the preacher. I don't want to do that. You may not know this, but God has a wonderful sense of humor. Yes, sir. Because I want to tell you this. It's a whole lot easier for people like me just to sit where you're at. It's a whole whole lot easier for me just to yawn and act sleepy like you do. It's a whole lot easier for me just to sit back and recline and, and just do my thing. But to be in front of people is a terrifying experience. I told Judy right before the uh, service this morning, I'm shaking. You guys are scary. But you know what? What I found out that my Jonah moment is not unlike your Jonah moment. Can I tell you that each of us in this room has had moments just like that. We have said and we have done our thing and God says I want you to I want you to get involved in the church and I want you to be active. I, I, Lord, you don't understand. My lifestyle just don't tend let me do that. I, I'm just too busy raising my family. I want you to do this, but God, you don't understand. I, I can't do this. God, I, I, God says, I want you to give this much. God, you don't understand. I've got a lifestyle to support. You don't understand that it's more important how, how I look in the community. It's more important my status in the community. It's what I do and what I say. And God, when I have time for you and when I get settled in my life and when I get everything to where I need it, then I'll give you a call back. You see, all of us in this room, I'm convinced, have Jonah moments. And can I tell you this? (laughs) While you check your phone and you see the status of your phone and and those bars declining and declining and declining and the the percentage says you've got 36% left on your phone and 22%. And here's what I've noticed about my phone. Can I tell you this? I'm not making this up. Did you realize when the battery of this phone gets so far down it gets in the red and it says connect to the charger? And you know what I found out? If you don't connect to the charger, this thing becomes useless. It becomes, listen, you can do whatever you want to. You can punch the numbers, you can look at it, but it's not going to have any effect. And can I tell you, in your own personal life, some of you walked in, now watch, some of you walked in this room, and your life is in the red right now. And God says, you need to, listen, you need to connect to the charger. You need to get busy serving me. Your time is limited. You need to get in involved in the church. You need to get involved under sound preaching. You need to support the preacher. You need to pray. You need to do these things. Listen, can I I tell you this? Your life is in the red and some of us in this room need to get connected right now. It's time for us to get connected. Well, preacher, I understand. Let me give you something that Jonah said that just, when I read this book afresh, something in our text verse stood out to me 
And I know that maybe you've heard this story over and over, but I wanted to share it with you again. In verse number 10, Brother Chris, if you'll bring that back up uh, upon our screen for us, notice what it says on the last part of that verse, if you would. Go to the last part. He fled from the present. To, now look what it says. Because he had told them. You know what he was saying? He told these godless sailors on board. He was running from God. And he told them. And he essentially said something like this. Yeah, I used to do that church thing. Yeah, I used to be involved in the men's prayer breakfast. Yeah, I used to be involved in all of the activities. And when the church doors was open, you could count on me. Well, no, wait a minute. Does someone understand what I'm saying? Here's what Jonah was saying. And he told them. He told them his life. He told them that he was running from God. Let me ask you. Are you? If God was here this morning, then we pray that He is. How would you give an account of your life to Him? Would you have to say, God, I'm kind of like Jonah. I've, I've been running recently and, and I know what you want me to do. I've, I've, I, I've, I've heard your voice and I understood that there is a thing, there's a plan, there's a design on my life and you really want me to be plugged into you. And God, I understand that, but there's just something holding me back. I, Lord, I know that I need to go to Nineveh, but the Tarshish is calling me. I feel like I need to go in the opposite direction. Look at, come on. You understand what the preacher just said? I feel like that some of us can identify with this guy called the runner. It's not so much, listen to me, it's not so much that we, we, we don't know what to do. We just, don't want to do it. You see, he tried to use an excuse in chapter 1 and verse number 9, and he says something like this, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. Now, I don't know about you, but here's what he was saying. I understand, now watch, this, this, this means everything to us. Here's what he was saying. Yeah, I understand God and I understand all of this and, and let's bring it to the modern day level. I understand the church thing and I understand the preaching thing and I understand the faithful thing. But, does somebody understand what I'm talking I really understand that God wants me to be plugged in to a local church and I really believe that God wants... All right, I'll just say it. I was going to save this for later. I really believe that God wants me to be plugged in to Calvary Baptist Church, get active, get excited, do the things that the, that, that they're doing there because I feel like the presence of God is there. I feel like they're doing things right. I feel like the music's right. I feel like the preaching's right. I feel like the spirit's right. Well, Maybe not. Jonah. Maybe he's more like us than we care to admit. You see, I believe that we have personally watched other people's lives spin out of control. Did you know that many refuse to take counsel, guidance, and pleadings where their life is going until it's too late? We discovered that this man Jonah did not desire to go to Nineveh. And can I tell you this? As I started studying this, I found something that maybe you need to understand. And, and, and I never heard this before. Are you ready for this? God says, go to Nineveh. He says, no, 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 I won't go. That's kind of what he said, all right? Maybe it's not quite like that in the book, but that's what he meant. But there's something about Nineveh that you and I might not want it either. Let me show you something. Did you realize that that ancient city developed the art now it's close to lunch so just bear with me. They developed the art of skinning people alive and seeing how long they would last. Now wait a minute. 
here's what I'm figuring. And here's what Jonah probably figured. I'm a preacher, and probably guess who would be the top of their list to be with that experiment? It's probably not the liberal, and it's probably not the, 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 the sinner out there, but I can just probably imagine Jonah saying, I know what they do to people, and I'm just not thinking that's my cup of tea, right? They perfected the art of skinning people alive and just to see how long they would last. And here's what God says. I want you to go to those people and I want you to preach to them. Here's what the prophet says. I don't think so. Oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, God, I mean, no, 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 no. So he went far, far away from the Lord. Did you realize that when we refuse to plug into the power source called Christ, he will allow you to travel your destination for a while, but you might as well know this. He's not changed his mind when he's given you an order to do. So, you know the story, and, and this is a small part of the story, but this is the only thing that we focus on when we get to this book, and it's something like this. Jonah chapter 1, verse number 17 says this, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish, watch, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. But let me give you this. The purpose of this fish was not so centuries later we could sing Sunday school songs about it. The purpose was to remind Jonah that God was serious when he called him to do something and the Lord was trying to get his attention. Now, let me just be so bold and give you this. I don't know everyone in this room personally, but I will go out on a limb and say this. God tries to get your attention in ways that we refuse. Sometimes he does the gentle nudge. But here's what, we, now watch, here's what we do. We don't respond to the gentle nudge. No, 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 no. So he gives you that and you say, no, no, I'm still not going to do it. So guess what? Step two comes. It's more than a gentle nudge. It's kind of a push. And here's what we say. Well, that's just one of those things. That's, that's just one of those things. Step three happens and it's like this. Hey! That's step three. But here's what I know about human people. Even though the hay comes, here's what we say. Well, you know, I've been doing it so... I kind of, I'm kind of stuck in this pattern. And even though what I'm doing is not working, I just as soon go ahead and do what I'm doing. Oh, wait a minute. Here's what I don't get. If what you're doing is not working, and God wants you to travel a different direction, why not try what God wants you to do? Well, because it's uncomfortable. And you mean to tell me your life is comfortable now? Well, he might ask me to do something I don't want to do. And you mean to tell me that everything you're doing right now you want to do? Do you understand sometimes it just doesn't make sense? God says, I want you to go over here and I want you to get plugged in. And it's, listen, if you get plugged into me, I can tell you, your life will function better under my direction, under you plugging into me, than it is you walk in your direction. That's what I don't get. Why don't we just learn as people of God that when we get off track and God does like this... We answer the door and say, come on in, Lord Jesus. What do you want me to do? No, 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 no. We don't want to do that because we feel like we're the masters of our own fate. And you don't understand, preacher. I can handle whatever comes my way. Really? Really, we're, we're, we're going to be so bold and to say something like that? Well, yeah, preacher, look at my life. I am looking at your life, and I'm telling you, you need to be plugged in today. Wow. Let me just tell you this. God's desire 
is he don't want to place you in harm's way. His desire to strengthen you and bring you back and to renew you. The Lord does what is necessary to win you back. But often we have to learn through painful lessons because we refuse to plug in. Now let me just, let me just give you this. Let's turn the clock back just for a moment. And let me ask you this. Let's be honest. If we could turn the clock back, let's just say a decade. If we could turn the clock back 10 years, everybody look up here. Do you think we would make some different decisions than maybe what we've made to this point? So, and and by the way, yeah, yeah, me too. But I'm learning and I've not arrived where I need to be totally. But here's what I'm learning. Boy, when I'm plugged in, watch. When I'm plugged into God and I, watch, I see those bars start to go up like this. You know what I figured out? It makes things better here. Is somebody getting this? Let me just tell you. Let me tell you how to make your home miserable. Preacher, you don't have to do that because it's already there. All right. So Ben, so it's already there. So let me go ahead and give you this. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep God out. Don't do what he wants you to do. You sit there and be miserable. Make your spouse miserable. And that is a real good existence. And can I tell you, all over Muleshoe, Texas, that's exactly where people are. Yeah, that's exactly where we live. You see, we, we, we don't want to go to church. We want to be faithful to God. We don't want to give. We don't want to do those spiritual disciplines. Why? Because we just feel like we don't want to do that because our life, we want to control our own life. Yeah, but can I tell you, when you control your own life and it's doing, and you're doing what you're doing now, where are you going? Can I tell you this? When you get plugged into God, He tells us and He gives us the direction that you and I can go. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Wow! Can, can I tell you what that means to me? That means, that means to me that if, my, listen, if my steps, watch, if my steps are ordered by the Lord, and that means that He directs my walk, can I tell you this? I just have a whole lot of confidence if He's directed my walk, then wherever I end up is going to be exactly where He wants me to be. Wow! Get plugged in. See your spiritual bars rise. And can I tell you this? Listen to the preacher. You're going to be more content. You're going to be more happy. You're going to be more thrilled than you ever have before. Why? Because you have learned the art of plugging in to the power source. Very quickly. In verse number 10, here's a question that I'd like to ask a lot of families. And Jonah listed for us in chapter 1, verse 10. This is a question that this preacher has wondered over and over and over and over. And it says, Why hast thou done this? Well, I don't understand that because that's too hard of a language, okay? Why did you do it? That's That's what it was. Here's what I don't understand. I've seen people, good people, darken the doors of the church, get encouraged by God, get under the preaching of the Word of God. It starts to come into their home and they start to get active in God and start to do the things that God wants them to do. Watch this. And then before you know it, a critical word was said. The devil got in in some way and they got out. The preacher goes to see them. Their heart is just a little hardened and they say something like this. Well, preacher, we can worship God at home just as well as we can at church. You don't understand, preacher. I, I, I got, I got relatives to go see on Sunday. I got things to do and, and you know this. It's my only day of rest. 
hogwash. Here's what I've learned. You use that principle and here's what happens. Sunday's your only day of rest, but watch. Before too long, you're going to get involved in hobbies or habits or whatever you do. You're going to get involved in all of that. And probably four or five weeks down the road, you are just as busy on Sunday as you are through the rest of the day of the week. You're just as frustrated as you are the rest of the day of week. This only day of rest has become just another work day for you. And my friend, can I tell you, that is just a bunch of bull. You and I know it. It's better if you and I would just learn the principle of plugging into the power source, serve God, love God, love one another, and do our very best. Let me give you an example. In 1945, it was an unbelievable year for evangelists. In that year, 27-year-old Billy Graham came storming out of seemingly nowhere to fill auditoriums across America, speaking to as many as 30,000 a night. Graham was hired as a first full-time evangelist for Youth for Christ And his reputation as a uniquely gifted preacher roared across America. And you know the rest is history. You've heard of Billy Graham, but what about Chuck Templeton or Braun Clifford? Billy Graham wasn't the only one packing auditoriums in 1945. Chuck Templeton and Braun Clifford were accomplishing the same thing and more. All three young men were in their mid-twenties. After hearing Chuck Templeton preach one evening to an audience of thousands, one seminary president called him the most gifted and talented young man in America today for preaching. Templeton and Graham were friends. Both ministered for Youth for Christ, and both were extraordinary preachers. Yet in those early years, most observers would probably have put their money on Templeton. In 1946, the National Association of Evangelicals published an article on men who were best used of God in that organization's five-year history. The article highlighted the ministry of Chuck Templeton, and Billy Graham was never mentioned. Templeton, many felt, would be the next Babe Ruth of evangelism. Ron Clifford was yet another gifted 25-year-old fireball. In 1945, many believed Clifford the most gifted and powerful preacher the church had seen in centuries. In that same year, Clifford preached to an audience of thousands in Miami, Florida. People lined up 10 and 12 deep outside the auditorium trying to get in. Later that same year, when Clifford was preaching in the chapel of Baylor University, the president ordered class bells turned off so the young man could minister without interruption to the student body. For over two hours, he kept the students on the edge of their seats. At the age of 25, Clifford touched more lives, influenced more leaders, and set more attendance records than any preacher his age in American history. In 1945, all three, Graham, Templeton, and uh, Clifford, came shooting out of the gates. Just five years later, Templeton left the ministry to pursue a career as a radio and television commentator and newspaper columnist. Templeton had decided he was no longer a believer in Christ, and by 1950, he was out of the ministry. By 1954, Clifford had lost his family, his ministry, and his health and his life. Alcohol and financial irresponsibility had done him in. He wound up leaving his wife and their two Down Syndrome children. At the age of 35, this once great preacher died from cirrhosis of the liver in a run-down motel on the edge of Amarillo. His last job was selling used cars. Some pastors in Amarillo took up a collection in order to purchase a casket so that his body could be shipped back east for a decent burial in a cemetery for the poor. Within ten years, only one of those men remained. Only one stayed true. Listen, only one plugged into the power source. Wonder if there could be someone here that is losing their power. You seem to lost interest and things are not going very well for you. Let me give you some quick thoughts and then I'm done. Something about verse number 15, I want you to notice in Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 15, it says this, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth 
into the sea. Now remember, nothing else worked to get his attention, so perhaps residing in the sea and in the mouth of a fish would do it. Now listen, if you're about to be swallowed, if things are getting over your head, what can you do about it? Is it too late for you to get up after you've been down a long time? Listen to me. When God tells you something, God's commands are not suggestions, they're commands. Amen. Now listen to me. Jonah's life looked different now because he refused God. How many are simply refusing God? Here's what I don't understand. There are many in this room this morning that I'm convinced, watch, I'm convinced that God does just like this. Every invitation, God knocks on hearts, but here's what we do. That's not for me. May I suggest something so that you understand where I'm coming from? Yes, it is for you. Can I tell you, when God knocks, it's time for us to get busy and serious about the things of God. They're not suggesting, they're commands. So many people today are not plugged in because of one command of God you said no to. And can I tell you, when you say no to one command, it gets easier and easier and easier to keep saying no. You didn't start out like this. But now you've lost interest and now you don't care. Chapter 2 and verse number 1, he gives him two commands, simple commands. And it says something like, like this, arise and go. Two commands spoken and two commands broken. Not major, stand, not major commands by our standards, but it did lead to a time of deep trouble and sorrow. Can I tell you this? If you and I would just get this in our minds, that when we refuse to follow God, nothing good can come from it. And somebody ought to say amen to that. Not only did Jonah refuse, but secondly, he relaxed. In verse number 6, Listen to me. Here's what the preacher see, sees all too often. In verse number 6, it says, O sleeper, arise and call upon thy God. Can I tell you this? By getting out of the service of the Lord, this prophet thought that he could take it easy. This prophet thought he could wind down. This prophet thought that he could relax and there'd be no problems. That modern day church is just exactly like this. And I'm convinced that God in heaven is saying to the church, Oh sleeper, arise, get to call to action and get busy with the things of God. Yes, 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 a thousand times yes. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse number 21 is a verse that you are to have highlighted and underscored in your Bible. Notice what it says. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. The word wicked means guilty, ungodly, and condemned. And that explains Jonah. He, listen... He would, he, he could, it, God would expose the wicked in, in Jonah's heart right there. There is, listen, there is no peace, saith God to the wicked. And can I tell you this? No matter how they want to try to mask it, no matter how you want to try to hide it, Preacher, I'm doing good monetarily. Fine, but I bet there's no peace. Preacher, everything's going good. But if we look deeper, I bet this, I bet I could say there's no peace and contentment in your life. Listen to me as I'm fixing the clothes. Beloved, what you and I need is to get plugged in, quit worrying about what someone else does or what someone else thinks, and just keep plugging in and keep plugging in and let your spiritual bars go as high as they possibly can and quit doing anything to forfeit God's blessings on your life. Oh, my goodness. So Jonah knew the best thing for him was to get out of the boat into the raging sea and take his chances. And can I tell you this? And then I'm done. When they cast Jonah into the water and God had stirred up the water and the matter of fact, it was so, it was so great that those hardened sailors was even scared. But when Jonah was thrown overboard... The water ceased. But here's what he told them. Watch. In order, watch, in order for things to calm down, you need to throw me over because me being in the water is safer 
than me being in the boat. The spiritual application is this. It is better for you to be in the raging waters with God than in a boat without God. That's the spiritual application. And watch this. When he got into the water, the Bible says it ceased. Yeah, but preacher, he got swallowed by fish. Yes, I understand that. But can I tell you this? God used that not for punishment, but to get his eyes focused back in the right direction. Let me just tell you this. Some of us spend a great time of our life running and running and running. Wouldn't it be easier if we would just simply say, here am I, send me. Here am I, God, whatever you want me to do. I need to be plugged in. Lord, I don't want to be out in my life and those spiritual bars are declining. And spiritually speaking, we can see our life sinking down deeper and deeper and deeper. And maybe you walked in the building and you thought, there's no hope for me. Let me just tell you this. As long as God is still on the throne, my friend, there's always hope for you. And as long as we live in the day of grace... There's hope for you. You know what? I love you so much that you need to know. Maybe you need to come and plug into Calvary Baptist Church this morning. Maybe you just need to come and pray over a situation in your life and get plugged in. Maybe there's something that you said or done this week to a friend, a co-worker, a family member, a church member. I don't know. Maybe you... You flew off the handle. Maybe there was something that, that God has convicted your heart over. Now is the time to do what God wants you to do. Father, we thank you that we can come be a part of a service like this. Father, it's my desire to live my life for you. Lord, so much do I want to keep plugged into you. Father, I've seen the other way and I don't like it. Father, I've seen the life that is out there and I don't want to be a part of it. God, I know. I know in this room there are people that are struggling in issues of life. And I know there are people, Lord, that need to be plugged in. Father, we cannot meet like this in this size without acknowledging there's a hurt, there's a need, there's a statement, there's a heart that needs to be plugged into you. Father, may, there may be somebody who walked in empty, but oh, Father, they can be charged up as they walk out. Lord, I would pray in this time that we share together that we would take full use of your benefits and we would do what you'd have us to do. Preacher, in my heart of hearts this morning, there are some areas of my life that I need to be plugged into, and I know it, I've struggled with it, and I would ask your prayers for it this morning. Would you lift up your hands all over the room, and I'll pray for you. Others, let's be honest, others. Come on, come on, come on, others, others, others. Any others? Any others? Oh, Father, you saw the hands. You saw the struggles. You saw the Jonas. Father, each one of us have ran from time to time. And this time we get serious with you once again. Please, do what needs to be done in this audience this morning. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me quietly and reverently? Boone, you and Miss Dana sing this first verse. Would you respond accordingly?